All right, here we are once again. Today's guest is Ari Maisel. He's an amazing productivity hacker. My name is Teo Moarina. I'm the host of Biohackers podcast. And uh, this is going to be our uh, fourth episode. And uh, uh, looking forward to today's interview. But before that, I'd like to remind you about Biohackers Summit. So Biohackers Summit takes place on 24th of September in Helsinki, Finland. And it's the place to be if you are interested in uh, quantified self, biohacking, life hacking in general, or any other way to really take your biochemistry and whatever you do in life to a completely new level, or even to extend your lifespan. Uh, we have people who are very much into transhumanism coming along. So it's not only taking what is given today, but also taking your biological potential beyond its, let's call it natural limits. Um, but without further ado, uh, oh yeah, check biohackersummit.com. That's the website address. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce our today's guest. So Ari Maisel is the author of Less Doing, More Living with the subtitle, Make Everything in Life Easier. His mantra, if you uh, Ari, allow me to rephrase, is to automate, outsource and optimize everything in your life not worth doing. And uh, almost you, you, you mix up the order a little bit. Yeah, yeah, on purpose. Uh, I'll let you dive deep okay, into it and, okay. and correct me. So Ari is also a family guy. And he just before this interview, he mentioned that he only works two days a week uh, in terms of uh, uh, meetings and so on. I'm, I'm really eager to hear how that's possible. Uh, he's also a Crohn's survivor. So if you have any kind of gut issues, uh, Ari is the guy who probably knows something about nutrition and hacking on that side as well. And uh, he's a living example of it because he eventually competed on Ironman France. And uh, there is a lot to his background. He, is, he sort of, I, I guess, started entrepreneurship already when he was 12 years old. Uh, that beats me by four years. So he's a he's pretty interesting uh, character and definitely uh, someone you can learn a lot in terms of uh, efficiency and, and rethinking the way how you conduct your day-to-day -day work. So, um, sorry, Tamar, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, Ari, um, what got you interested in all this business of less doing? Well, uh, a few things. Um, so it started off in, uh, let's see, I guess 2007. And basically I was working in construction for three years and was living this incredibly, incredibly unhealthy lifestyle. And I was very stressed and I, I was, I, I was drinking a lot of alcohol. I was eating fast food and I put my body into a state of just fragility where it broke essentially. And I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. So I'm sorry, is that, is the noise of dogs bothering you there? It doesn't okay. matter. I mean, let's ignore right. it. A lot of stuff going on in my house. So uh, I got really sick. I got diagnosed with Crohn's disease and I got really, really sick. So Crohn's, for those who don't know, is a chronic inflammatory condition that affects the digestive tract. It's considered to be incurable. It's very, very painful. And I was put on a lot of medicine, uh, about 16 pills a day, and was getting sicker and sicker and weaker and weaker. And <clears throat> there's sort of a confluence of factors that happened that led to what I do now, which is, first of all, I had gone from working literally 18 hours a day to get into a state where I could sometimes barely do an hour of work a day, like barely. And I had a family. I mean, I, well, I had, a, I was married, I had a business to run and I had a choice of whether or not I could sort of crumble or thrive. So very quickly I began to figure out other ways to get more work done in that literally that hour a day, which was a really interesting basis for what would come later because then as I started to heal myself and through a lot of self-tracking, a lot of quantified self stuff and, and, and not to sidetrack, but the interesting thing for me about the quantified self aspect of what happened to me was that it's not so much that I analyzed the data and I found like this was the right treatment or this, it was more that having that data and looking at it gave me a sense of control in a scenario where I was at war with my own body. And it was really powerful because there's a huge emotional component to something like Crohn's and in, inflammatory conditions in general, which is sort of how I came full circle to create the system. Because what I realized 
was that the nutrition, the supplements and the fitness aspects of what was going on with my illness were actually fairly straightforward. I've replicated my results in dozens of other Crohn's patients. It's really easy to tell somebody, eat this, take these supplements and do these exercises. But it's much, much harder to, some, to tell somebody, stress less. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, well, I have a pretty similar story myself uh, with digestive issues. I had an ulcer and uh, I, I'm with you right there. Uh, if you have any kind of gut issues, it is really uh, sucking all the energy out of you. So you had only an hour a day or a couple of hours a day to feel productive. And uh, so what, what were the kind of key things that made you regain your life, your health and your fitness to do maybe even more? And what kept you actually uh, and your, on your routine of, of, of doing less per day? So it, it, it very quickly became apparent to me, as I said, that stress was a big component of this. So I needed some sort of systematic way of dealing with that stress. And that's where less doing was really born from. I, I, I came up with this concept. It was actually funny. I was on the phone with somebody and I came up with it right on the spot, basically saying like, this is what I teach people to do. I tell people how to optimize, automate and outsource everything in their lives. And they're like, what's that? And basically, as you, as you sort of said earlier, that is the backbone of everything that I do with less doing, whether it's a productivity problem or a health problem, that is the framework that I use to attack everything. And to explain that, what I mean is when you optim, anybody can outsource things. It's very easy nowadays. I can outsource something to uh, any other country in the, in the world pretty much for probably $5 and get something done. And that's great. And I do do that a lot. But the problem is that a lot of people do that first. And if you simply outsource something without going through the process of trying to make it more efficient inherently, you're really not making the problem go away. You're just sort of sweeping the dirt under the rug, as it were. Hmm. And eventually that will come back and bite you in one way or another. So you really have to optimize first. And for me, optimization really is tracking. It's really quantified self because you need to stop and look at the processes that you're going through on a regular basis, the, the way you're spending your money, the amount of sleep you're getting, the amount of time you spend on the phone, the length of emails that you, I mean, the, everything we do can be quantified as you know. And as I said before, part of that is just having a sense of control because what a lot of people end up feeling when they feel overwhelmed because of a lack of productivity, a lot of times it's simply because they're unaware of what's causing the overwhelm. So a little bit of self-tracking goes a long way when it comes to that. So you start with the optimization. Then once you've done that, you've looked at the process, you've said, okay, look, this, this step doesn't make sense. And this, this is redundant and I can clean this up. Then you get a nice, basically a checklist in a lot of cases. Then you look at automation and this is my playground now because the way the technology has improved over the last you know, several years, there's things that we can automate now that a person had to do three months ago. And especially in the quantified self movement, and free resources like IFTTT or Zapier, which allow you to automate interaction between various web services, you can take entire processes and automate them with free tools so that you don't have to do them. And more importantly, a person doesn't even have to do them. I, in, in fact, last week, I launched a new company with a partner of mine, which is a virtual assistant company. And the entire company process is built on free tools that automates everything from the training of the assistants to the managing of tasks. So once you go through optimize and automate, then that's when we first look at outsourcing. And with outsourcing, it's straightforward. We're looking at sending something to a specialist or a generalist to have them do. But once you've gone through that process, you reduce the, 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 the ability for there to be errors and you're getting it so that it can be replicated by anybody else without training. Right. So uh, to dive deeper into those aspects, so uh, let's start with quantify self uh, before we go into uh, the op automation part. Uh, so optimize. What were the, what were the things that you were paying attention to, and um, uh, so sort of what were the things that you figured out were the main things that you really learned something from, and uh, how did you use the data, and uh, what was the meaning of it for you? Uh, f specifically for the crowns. Yeah, I mean, generally, uh, you're talking about uh, really figuring out uh, what could be the cause of uh, your activities. 
And right. um, uh, why do you behave like you do? And what are the things like, what could be the 20% that results in 80% of improvement? So what were the things for you? So I'll give you a really good one, which is the question of the hour a day is a really fascinating one to me because now a lot, a lot of times when I give a talk, I will ask that question to people. I'll say, you know, what, what would you do if you can only work an hour a day? And, and some people chuckle and I say, well, no, it's a really, it's a serious question. And I actually had to do that as, as I already explained to you, because first of all, it's an interesting experiment. I, I'm going to answer your question, but it's, a, it's an interesting experiment. First of all, because if I just told you, look, you have to work an hour less each day. That's a very, very different thing than telling somebody you can only work one hour in an entire day, right? So if I tell you, look, you're not allowed to work past four o'clock in the day after. So then, okay, so maybe you skip lunch or maybe you, uh, you know, make a few more phone, like something. It, it's kind of easy to get there. But telling somebody you can only work an hour a day is, 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 it stretches your mind in a way that most people are not used to. So there is a concept called peak time or prime time. And every one of us has it. It's not, it's not a theoretical thing. It's a real thing. And it is a usually a 90 minute period each day where you are at your peak, at your best. And you are most likely and can do it the, most, the, the easiest to get into your flow state. 90 minutes, right? So if you can identify what that 90 minute period is and you can work effectively in that period and respect it and create an environment where you can use that time effectively, you are two to 100 times more effective in that 90 minute period than you are any other time of the day. So what does that mean? That means that if you actually do that, you can pretty much do an hour of work a day and be more productive than any other time of the day, right? How do we find that? So do you know what the, have you heard of the CNS tap test? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's reaction time test. Right, exactly. So I actually had a, a hypothesis, which I've found evidence to correlate and I've, I've, sh I've tested this with a number of clients. If you do the CNS tap test every hour of the day for three or four days as a test, you will be able to use that to identify your peak time. So you're going to find that there are certain times throughout the day when you are more reactive, more on top of it, you know, and it's not going to be a big number. It's going to be a big difference. The Delta is small, but if you, you know, it's statistically significant, obviously if you collect enough data, so what, uh, uh, what application, uh, sorry to interrupt, but what application would you use to do that uh, tap test? And um, how do you see like things like blood sugar fluctuations and things like that play into it? Well, so first of all, okay, so there's a number of free apps that can do this, but I mean, you know, as well as I do, you can just tap your finger on the table and time it for a minute and see how many you get, right? Uh, Smudge.io, I think, makes a pretty basic one, their, their finger tap test. And, uh, and it also, they, they make it so you can export it to a CVS file, which makes it, or CSV file, which, which makes it really easy too. So yeah, that's a really good one because a lot of people will tell you, if you ask the question, a lot of people will say that they think that their peak time is, is in the morning, like nine, 10 o'clock. Most, for most people, that's just coffee and they don't realize that. And energy is not the same as focus. You want to have a state where your high, energy is high and your focus is high. So yes, you're going to have those fluctuations. And that may in fact play into when your peak time is. Mine happens to be between 10 and noon. I know that for a fact. Uh, and I know that it's not coffee because I am genetically, I am a fast caffeine metabolizer and I usually have my coffee by six in the morning. So it's not affecting me at 10 o'clock. Uh, and I've tested this out. And I just know that 10 to 12 is my, my peak time, but you have people, you'll see peak times three to five, uh, sometimes you'll have people at 11 o'clock at night. I've, I have one person whose peak time is four in the morning, which is unfortunate for her, but she knowing that is great because she used to just wake up and stare at the ceiling, but now she actually uses that time effectively. So, uh, if you do it for enough days, I, I found that three sometimes is enough to see a little bit of a pattern, but you know, if you do it for a week or so, you should have the data to know pretty accurately what your peak time is. Okay. Um, now, if we if we go into the coffee and uh, other things, so what are the like nutritional interventions that you have found useful uh, in maintaining your energy levels and uh, getting more done? So I I used to obviously have a very 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 bad diet, and part of the problem with that, besides the eating the unhealthy food is that you're, you're not in tune with your body, 
you know, so now that I, I have a much sort of cleaner body, I guess you could say, I, I'm more able to listen to what my body needs. So that's, that's one thing, which is really good. And I find that seasonally my sort of appetite and metabolism changes. So I, I like intermittent fasting as a concept, uh, but I typically can't do it or won't do it in the warm months. And I'm not, I don't know why that is other than the obvious reasons that maybe in the winter, your metabolism is a little slower, but in the winter, I really, really benefit from intermittent fasting for some reason. But as far as nutritional stuff, I, my basic diet is high fat, low sugar. And low sugar has always been a challenge for me because I have legitimately have like a sugar addiction issue with uh, everything that comes along with that. But I'm when I am not eating any sugar, I am actually at my peak and it, I feel better and I, I sleep better, everything about it. So I'm usually pretty good about that. And then high fat is the other one. I mean, I have a lot of butter, a lot of coconut oil, grass-fed beef, pastured egg yolks. The, the fats just really, really do me well. On um, the days when I'm working, the Mondays and Wednesdays, I typically won't eat for the entire work day. So I'll have something for breakfast and then I'll have something in the evening. But I actually do find food during the day to be a big distraction, honestly. And I, I believe that it is in a lot of ways. So it's really nice to eat sort of before the sun comes up and after the sun comes down. All right. That's, uh, that's one of the hacks that you can get into. I like to do a high protein, high fat kind of breakfast. Um, I find it takes me much longer uh, in the morning hours and I like to do a low carb kind of lunch and uh, maybe a bulletproof coffee kind of thing in the afternoon, time it right at the, uh, uh, the drop of the uh, blood sugar levels, uh, usually mm -hmm. combined with some cinnamon to fight that. By the way, I find uh, coumarin containing cinnamon more effective. Um, uh, seems like this liver toxin is part of the reason why it is uh, uh, cinnamon can be beneficial for maintaining uh, steady blood sugar levels. In terms of quantified self, I would like to find uh, things like uh, continuous glucose monitoring uh, becoming commercially available soon because that would also be for anyone who wants to hack their productivity, a pretty essential tool, not just for diabetics, but for anyone who's interested in steady uh, source of energy. Now, to jump into the automation part, you mentioned that you have launched a virtual assistant kind of uh, company. Uh, you deploy virtual assistants as well. While I was emailing you uh, with you to get your tickets for uh, the biohacker summit. I was wondering uh, if you were using a uh, virtual assistance there to trick me that I was uh, not talking to you, but one of your assistants. So do you, do you use these kind of tricks? No, no, that was me. Uh, I'm actually very, very transparent about it because of what I do. I actually get a kick out of it when uh, assistants do things for me or I have something outsourced. So I, I'm, I, I'm very obvious about it when I do that. Right, right. And um, I, I've had experience with Sirtual, uh, uh, for example, uh, and uh, many of these uh, uh, services like 99designs and CrowdSpring and others uh, to outsource some of the activities. And uh, Sirtual, by the way, just recently shut down within a day and then they opened up a week later. Uh, it's, uh, it's no, a day later, actually, which I think was much worse. But part of the reason that the company, my new company launched was actually because of the the meltdown hmm. of virtual. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned uh, earlier that if you if you optimize a task, uh, then you will be more likely to be able to outsource that. And I, I find that also true. While I've been using assistants, if you find a way how to do it yourself and you know how to do it in an optimal way, that's when you can outsource that. I'll give you a good example. I, I've been working on some video projects over the year years and. Uh, uh, I had to learn everything in it. I mean, uh, the video editing part, uh, shooting video, uh, doing color corrections, uh, putting the audio in, uh, mastering the audio. So I, I learned all of those skills. And once I was able to do every single part of a movie project, I was able to outsource every single part of the movie project, uh, excluding the script writing, because I like to put the story in there myself. Uh, so... Um, uh, What's your like practical tips to anyone who wants to take whatever they do every day uh, in a routine way and just, you know, hand it over to someone else? Like, how, how would you go for it? So the first thing to do is start looking at 
uh, some people already just have a sense of this, what, like what's taking the most of their time, but try to look at the processes that you're going through on a regular basis. So the things that you're doing daily or maybe even weekly, but every one of us has things that we're doing daily. And that could be, you know, everything from paying a bill to hiring and firing people to how you make your lunch. And if you just take any of those processes and you take it through this process of, or this uh, framework of optimize, automate, outsource, then you can really start to see the patterns of emerge and you start to find solutions that are applicable to other things in your life. It's a, it's, it really is a skill set that people need to develop in terms of how they, they, it, it's a mindset shift. That's the thing is I, I, one of the things that I'm often talking about with people is that I recommend lots of technology and apps a lot of times, but at the fundamental base of this, it really is a mindset shift that has to take place in terms of how you approach the things that you're doing that you're being more or less productive on. Hmm. What are like the kind of key tools that you have found useful? Do you use like some something like text expander that enables you to use ready sentences or or, or just like uh, what, what would go into your tool set uh, before you outsource something to a real human being? So uh, Evernote is sort of my my hub for everything. So I, and for a number of reasons. One, Evernote is is my external brain. So I really depend on it to out offload everything. I believe that ideas need flow, and we need to be offloading things from our brain as much as possible. But in addition, Evernote has some really great features for this kind of stuff, in that you can share a notebook. So you can create a process that's written down in a notebook or a note rather. And I have. 80 or so of those processes, everything from uh, posting to my blog, to my podcast, to home stuff. And I can share those anytime. And in addition, Evernote ties in with IFTTT and Zapier, which for if you don't know, those are automation platforms where you can then connect Evernote to anything like Trello or uh, your Fitbit, or you know, you can have it so that anytime you step on your withing scale, those numbers go into Evernote, and and then that information can be shared and crunched and used one way or another. So Evernote really becomes like the hub for everything for me, to, for when I start. So uh, you use Evernote with your uh, assistants as well? Yes, absolutely. So I have processes in there, and then they are uh, they're shared that way, so that anybody without any tra- any training can do it. Right. And um, uh, let's take some like simple examples uh, or, uh, to, or tools that people use every day, like email. What are like your top like productivity hacks for email? So that, okay. So inbox zero for me is, is sort of a, a, a fun thing. And actually I, right now I'm working on an article about email zero. Uh, thanks to Slack and some other things, I'm, I'm I'm trying to see if I can eliminate email completely, maybe, uh, but we'll see. So uh, essentially, there's there's two things that need to happen with email. One is that you need to set up a, a very simple filter, which is that any email that has the word unsubscribe in it should automatically be filtered out of your inbox and put into an optional folder. This is very important because that takes care of about 60% of the emails that most people get. And by filtering that stuff out of the active important emails into an optional folder, when you then go into that optional folder, you are switching psychologically into optional mode. And you can go through those emails much more quickly than you could. Because the problem with most inboxes is you'll have email from boss, email from spouse, email from coworker, Facebook, Twitter, Groupon, email from spouse, you know, and you're, you're causing your brain to switch back and forth. And we get decision, you know, whatever you want to call it, people have fancy terms for all this stuff now, but if it's, it's, it's rapid switching back and forth between different task ideas, which is what really, what we're really doing when people think of multitasking, we're not to actually multitasking, we're just switching back and forth really quickly and it's exhausting and it's not a good use of our resources. So Filtering that information out means that when you click on the optional folder, your brain is like, okay, well now it's optional. Nothing in here is essential and super important. So I can go through the headlines really quickly and find what I need. So that's one thing. The second thing is that when you deal with an email, you can only deal with it once. And it's the three Ds. Either you delete it because it's not relevant or doesn't require a response, which is an interesting one because I'd say about 40% of the emails that people respond to do not actually require a response. And I'm talking about when someone's like, thanks or great or see you know like those kinds of things are just not necessary and and the problem is is you could say well it's just being courteous but the truth is is that you're creating more email in the system and the more email you send the more email you get so you're doing 
the other person a disservice by sending them that email. The second thing you can do is deal with it. Now, if it's something you can do right now in the next five minutes, don't wait. Deal with it right now because there's not going to magically be some other five minutes later. And dealing with it could include delegating it. So that might mean that dealing with it is, you know, sending it to your assistant or to your spouse or to your coworker, whatever it might be. And then the third one is the most interesting, which is to defer it. So if you can't delete it and you can't deal with it because now is not the right time, then you have to defer it to a time that is the right time. And the best tool for that, in my opinion, is followup.cc, where you can forward that email to Monday, 8 p.m. at followup.cc, or three days at followup.cc, or one week at followup.cc, any email, any uh, time period you want. And the idea is, first of all, you don't want that to come in during your peak time, but also realizing that there are better times and worse times for us to do any of the things that we do, you know, whether it's working out between three and five is usually the best, uh, but it could be, you know, eating before the sun rises or eating after the sun goes down or doing creative work. Like all of these things have better times and worse times. So you want to defer it to the time that you can most effectively deal with it. There's your, there's, there's the quick answer. Yeah. I, I also used uh, a few extensions. One of them is uh, Yesware. It's uh, yeah, sort of like, similar, uh, yeah. it's like uh, this uh, boomerang or something like this. Um, basically you can, uh, when you send someone an email, you can check a box if you want to be reminded, if that person doesn't answer, uh, you can also schedule email to be sent on a specific, uh, time of day. So I often use that to avoid people replying me in the evenings and so on. So I just send it off, uh, next morning to them. Uh, so they get the, their email re responses during the day. Uh, there is also a pretty interesting extension called uh, the email game that enables me to have almost like a gamification of uh, reading email. So I have a timer running for each email and uh, there is also uh, uh, some rewards that I'm getting uh, uh, for the time that I spend on, on these things and how many how many emails I'm, I'm crunching through in, in a, what kind of time. So absolutely, I think um, I, I'm pretty... I pretty much think that um, email is a badly designed uh, to-do application because anyone can send you an email. Uh, and yep. uh, it's sort of like a to-do list there where anyone can put an item on your to-do list uh, without asking you. So there is an email in your inbox and you have to do something about it. And uh, I, I absolutely love Gmail filters that enable me to filter out things. Uh, one of the things that I use for is uh, uh, all kinds of receipts from... Uh, internet shopping and I have to do or have those around for bookkeeping and I basically filter uh, which uh, ready set rules uh, those to be sent to a specific inbox and I have an assistant that goes into that inbox and checks the, checks them through uh, checks which company those belong to and uh, makes a PDF out of them so I never see any of those things that I've pre-approved uh, to to go to a, to my bookkeeping and I, it's a lifesaver. I mean, it's for entrepreneurs, it's, it's a great thing. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, uh, schedule, scheduling. So um, I guess you must be booking a lot of things and just podcasts, but uh, but some, some things once in a while. So what are like your top tools for scheduling and tips and tricks for that? You said that you work only two days a week in terms of meetings. So... Uh, the main tool I use is called Schedule Once, and this is a, it's an interesting tool because it makes things really easy for both parties. So Schedule Once basically connects with my calendar in real time, and it will show people on a public page, which is meetme.so slash A-R-I-M, anytime that I'm available. Uh, it won't show them when I'm what I'm doing when I'm busy, but it'll just show when I'm available. And what's most important about it is that you can set office hours. So I can sell it to only show availability on Mondays and Wednesdays. And what I like about this is that uh, if you had to guess, Timo, what, what do you think is the average number of emails that are required to schedule a meeting? Probably 25. <laughs> so it, it's actually 8.1, but that's still a lot. And if you use something like schedule once, you can turn it into one or zero. So I actually have it in my signature on my email. It says, want to schedule a meeting? Click here. And what I love about it and what people love about it is that I'm giving them it's not quite the illusion, but I'm giving them the, the sense that they have the control over when they can pick things and that's more convenient for them. Because I can say to somebody, listen, I don't know what my schedule is, which is true. Uh, just go to this link and pick any time that works for you. Now, I'm not saying this to you like I'm, you know, it's some big secret. It, it, it's 
true that I don't have a very available schedule. It's fairly restricted, but I am still giving people the option, you know, so if they really want to meet with me this week or talk to me this week, then they're, they're going to have, you know, very, very limited options. But if they you know, want to be a little more flexible, then they can wait a week or two or three. I have people who book meetings with me two to three months in advance now, which is awesome for me because that's like an amazing litmus test. If it's somebody who I don't even know, and they're willing to wait two months to meet with me, then the, you know the, they deserve 15 minutes to, to talk to me, right? So it's a really, really good thing. Plus it has a rescheduling link right in there. So if somebody needs to reschedule, they don't even have to tell me. They can just, uh, they can just go with it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you knew, but uh, one of the businesses that I work with is, uh, it works in this uh, area. So it's called uh, Swipe to Meet. Uh, Swipe oh. to Meet. And that's a mobile application for scheduling uh, meetings uh, with a group of people and um, the way how we deal with it is that we completely eliminate looking at the calendar from the equation so you're basically setting up the principles uh, at which you like to meet for example you only want to have a lunch meeting uh, only on Thursdays or also Wednesdays uh, during lunchtime and it will send uh, based on your calendar and your phone suggestions to people and they will swipe uh, on uh, their availability so if they download the app they can also uh, uh, get only suggestions that fit their calendar as well. So it's usually a couple of um, confirmations and, and we have a time. Uh, if they don't download the app, they receive a text message and the text message opens up a link uh, to a mobile optimized site where they can uh, uh, provide their availability based on my calendar. And um, it, it's, it's a great tool. For the last half a year, I haven't been looking at my calendar at all. I set these yeah. specific principles, specific schedulers for different types of meetings. And I can um, probably with schedule ones, that's also possible. Uh, you can um, have different types of uh, uh, like uh, your own scheduling pages for different purposes. So I have one for uh, meetings at my office. I have one for Skype calls uh, or phone calls. And uh, the one that is meetings at my office, uh, that takes my travel calendar into account. Uh, so it, it blocks my availability if I'm traveling uh, for that period. Right. And um, phone calls I can receive any time. So that's more flexible. So depending on the type of meeting, um, I, I like to use that. And I've used uh, these tools to schedule meetings in such a way that I usually get uh, a specific context for a specific day. So at one, one day, I'm just, you know, uh, going meeting people out there. Uh, one day I'm meeting them Physically, I'm just sitting in the same meeting room the whole day and doing some uh, high intensity interval training in between. And uh, on some days, I'm I'm just you know uh, uh, having phone calls uh, or or online meetings. Uh, so so it's a great way that you don't have to switch your context uh, when you schedule things that it's sort of pre uh, preset in such a way that it those appointments get uh, fit into a specific context and you don't have to switch between tasks. That's pretty cool. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, what are your other favorite sort of productivity tools, uh, beyond email and, uh, uh, Evernote? Well, so as I mentioned, IFTTT is a big one for me and, uh, sorry, one second. Oh, okay. IFTTT is a big one for me. And uh, that's just because it helps automate all those different processes between much of the web services I use. It's the kind of things that take 45 seconds, 60 seconds to do, but you're doing them dozens or hundreds of times a day. And that gets rid of those completely. Um, I also use Trello, uh, but that's not so much a personal thing. I'm using Trello mostly for uh, the assistance, the assistant program that we're doing. And that's a really great way to manage tasks across an entire organization. So, so if anyone wants to sign up and try out some of your virtual assistant services, uh, where, where can they find more information about this? So it's, uh, it's, it's very, very limited right now. And, but people can go to lessdoing.com slash VA, like virtual assistant, and they can sign up for the wait list where we want to make sure that we do this in the best possible way. So it's, it's, we're rolling it out very, very slowly. Gotcha. So, um, mm, uh, what, uh, do you deploy for things like, uh, document editing and writing? I mean, I know you're an author and, uh, you have worked on a book already and, uh, you are pushing out a lot of podcasts and, uh, blog posts and, uh, whatnot. So 
how do you attack the 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 task of writing well <laughs> it, uh, writing is is a challenge for me honestly like it's it's i find it really really tough and it's just not like the way that my brain sort of functions so my first book less doing was actually ghost written from a video lecture that i did so uh, i actually as much as i can i try to outsource writing uh, even blog posts and stuff now I, I would much rather be doing podcasts like this kind of thing where i can talk things out and and then have somebody else who's much more qualified to do the writing for me so that's sort of the, that's my answer but the truth is, is that you can outsource writing very cheaply now to people who are very very good at it there's a really great website called speed lancer which is unbelievable it, it, you can get really really good writing done in four hours or less hmm. do you use like proofreading services or anything that uh, increase the quality of your, your writing well so if i when i uh when i use um when I use a copywriter or a writer, it's somebody that I've worked with. Like I like to develop a relationship at least. And then I'll have a, a virtual assistant proofread it typically. Uh, I, sometimes I'll even have two different virtual assistants proofread the same thing just to cover my bases. Hmm. So uh, what what would be like the kind of uh, virtual assistant services you use? Like uh, I would imagine you hire just general VAs and some specialized ones for specific tasks. And where do you find them? Uh, so for, well, for my company now, it's, it's a lot of them are coming from virtual, honestly, like we're finding people who are just looking for that kind of work now, but, uh, I would previously, I would have used virtual myself. Uh, I think fancy hands is a really great resource. It's, it's an on-demand virtual assistant service. So you're having access to thousands of virtual assistants that can do things 24 seven. So, uh, that, and then Fiverr is really great for specific projects and, uh, and now even speed Lancer too. Hmm. Gotcha. So um, I would like to touch the the topic of uh, quantified self once more, and uh, maybe ask no. you about some of your like favorite uh, tools in that space. So, so have you used some wearables or any kind of like external uh, devices uh, for tracking things like sleep and uh, exercise and uh, yeah. so apps and, used, and so I've on? Used, I've used everything. Um, I, I my favorite sleep tracker is the Bedit. And, uh, the, uh, I have the Apple watch, which is very limited, honestly, right now, I think, but it, the sensors are not limited. It's just the applications are limited. So there's finally, there was an app that just came out called cardiogram that can take your Apple watch data 20 times a day and give you your resting heart rate and how that changes over time. Um, I, I do a lot of blood testing, honestly, I, I do a lot of like home tests for saliva, hair, uh, the, the stool samples, you know, any, 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 anything that you can kind of produce basically that, uh, I can get out there. So I, I do a lot of testing that way. There's less with the devices now, but I do, uh, the, let's see what else the, um, the Lumo back was a fun, was a good one, really helped with my posture, uh, the new version, the one that goes like up on your upper clavicle. I, ha and, I have the uh, Lumo leaf by the way here. Yeah, there you go. That's yeah. the one. Yeah. This is, this is the smaller new version. It's pretty, pretty cool device. I mean, I hacked my posture in two months, like uh, in a way that was impossible in years of paying attention to my posture. Exactly. I mean, it's it's amazing how just that little that buzz, right, just tells you. Uh, and then um, I do a lot of like, I'll, I'll, it's sort of contrary to what I what I often talk about. A lot of the tracking that I'll do is actually more active than passive. So one of the things that is like uh, IFTTT makes a a app called do it's the do button and you can just hit a button to do whatever you want so i had for a long time when i was dealing with a lot of these sugar tracking or these sugar issues i created a sugar tracker very very simple all it was is if i got a craving i opened the, the thing and i could do it on my watch i pushed the button and it would note the time and the place in an evernote note and within about a week i noticed a very clear pattern that it was like always happening between three and five, which kind of makes sense, obviously like low sugar time. And it was happening uh, only at home. So basically it was like, okay, well, there's something at home that's tempting me at the time. So I, very simply what I did was I would take that, I would, I would try to be out of the house at that time and go for a walk or go somewhere with the kids or do phone calls outside or whatever I could do. And that worked really, really quickly, I have to say. So 
yeah, gotcha. That's, gotcha. You know, sometimes it's a, it's sort of cobbling together of different tools. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been using all kinds of things, and I find the Lumo Lift uh, extremely useful. Bedit is is a great device. I use also another Finnish company, by the way. Bedit is a Finnish company. Is M uh, M Fit E M F I T. Yeah, uh, and they also provide uh, stress levels, um, so you get um, basically an average uh, uh, and an understanding over time, like uh, how your day-to-day work influences your uh, nervous system and uh, readiness. Basically, uh, that's pretty useful. Another yeah. thing that I've been I've been recently experimenting with is that, that I have a biometric shirt actually on. So this uh, shirt that I have on, this black oh, shirt. Which one? Is uh, ohm signal, so yeah, I, I test. I was a beta tester. Yeah, so I have some data coming in, and uh, I find it pretty useful, so that I, I, I can see my uh, day right here, how it's been going. I've been sitting yeah. quite a lot, so it's pretty flat. Um, but um, uh, what I like about this one is um, they have biometric tests for recovery assessment. Uh, so that's like the heart rate recovery after exercise, and there's also workout readiness, so you can get an idea of. Uh, of, of, of your readiness uh, for uh, that's pretty much a HRV kind of a measurement thing, and uh, those are those are pretty useful tests. Uh, I, I I have to say, Ma- gets you into the zone of understanding your own physiology and uh, how things work uh, in your body. Uh, it, it gives a pretty interesting uh, picture of your day also as well. So it's it's fun to sometimes look at the data and ah oh, okay that's the point when I was having a podcast. Oh that's the point where I was. Uh, uh, I was uh, biking really fast to the next meeting, or so whatever it is, uh, and uh, it's uh, it's very interesting what this data can do to make you more self-aware of the patterns in your life uh, and the feedback loops that they can create, so that you can uh, become more aware uh, and faster. Also, have these kind of corrective moves uh, built in into your day-to-day life because you are reminded of specific things. But I find it sort of like almost ironic that uh, the whole industrial revolution and technological progress that we have made, uh, all the technology has freed us to do all these things. And you are a productivity hacker. You use all these tools and technologies to hack, to have even more free time. And um, in the end, the same technology, we need to save ourselves in a way. You You need a watch to tell you that you've been sitting for too long. Or you need a activity tracker to tell you how many steps you take because you're not moving enough. Uh, you need all kinds of nutritional, uh, uh, like hacking things, uh, quantifying calories or whatever, to figure out how to eat properly. So it's almost like we have forgotten how to be real human beings, like how to live a good life. And yeah. now we now we have to use all this technology. Isn't it ironic in a way? I mean, the technology freed us to be more human, enjoy more what we do. And what did, did we do? We eat crappiest food ever. We sleep less. Uh, we don't exercise. We don't do anything. We're just lazy bums. And that's uh, that's that's pretty sad picture right there. But uh, I, I, I'm an optimist. I mean, I'm a technological determinist. So I believe the technology can also free us from... Uh, the things that we are doing to ourselves uh, and uh, uh, help us pay attention to things like posture. <laughs> so it's amazing times we are living in. Absolutely. And I would love to ask you actually about the future work. So how, where do you see all of this going? I mean, you have been looking at all these tools and technologies. You see the potential already. You're tapping into the potential in ways that very few people do. So where do you want to take all of this and and where do you see things going? What are the areas that you would like to see developing or progressing so that you can benefit uh, even more of uh, of the technological progress we are in? So I'm sorry, you cut out like a little bit there. Can you just repeat it one more time? Yeah. So what are the so- sort of things that you see in terms of the future of the work uh, that you are excited about? Uh, what do you see that is coming? What are the areas that you feel that should improve also um, and uh, so that you can benefit of the progress that we are making even more in the future? Yeah, so I, you already said one of them, honestly, which was the continue glu- continuous glucose monitoring. I think that that's an enormous one. Uh, honestly, like that's a big one because I, I just watched the, that sugar film the other day, which is a very overproduced documentary, honestly, in my opinion. It didn't teach me anything i didn't already know but it, it the subject is important and uh, have you heard of it by any chance not at all 
so this guy basically tries to eat the the stand what he's australian and he wants to eat for two months the amount of sugar that most australians eat which is 40 teaspoons a day uh but he wants to do it without eating any any junk food at all or any fast or anything like that only healthy foods so uh what he and he thought that that was gonna be very difficult and he finds that he, he does it by like 10 in the morning every day because it's you know in the yogurt and in the juices and all that stuff so uh i think that people don't recognize the the bad effects that we get from over fluctuation of sugar in our body honestly too little and too too much and I, I think that it leads to emotional problems i think it leads to problems in relationships with families and uh, certainly with health issues so i think that if you learn a lot more about how your sort of glucose levels are going that's a very big one so if you could make that information more you know a lot easier that would be great and i think it will be because you know, heart rate monitoring was not a common thing, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, maybe, but now, like, everybody has a heart rate monitor, right? Like, that's just, it, when it first was a, it was first just a thing for, like, runners, basically, with the polar, you know, the polar straps on your chest, but now, like, everything. I mean, I think, I'm pretty sure that there's a company that makes, like, a teddy bear that can get the heart rate of your baby, you know? So, like, it, that's, if it's that commonplace, then I think eventually, and obviously, glucose monitoring currently is a little bit more invasive, but I think that that's a big one. The other one, of course, is just correlations. That's the big thing because a lot of people end up, in my experience, they'll track a lot of different things, but then they don't do anything with the data. You know, it's like, oh yeah, I have a year's worth of me weighing myself every day on my body fat. It's like, okay, and, and they don't know what to do with that. It's like, well, that's great, but we can look at fluctuations here and maybe we can notice that there were weather patterns that had an effect or there were big crises in your life and the effect from the crisis was a month later those kinds of things where we're taking more information into account and correlating it for you. So it's already, we're already at the point where you can passively collect a lot of the data, but now we need to passively correlate that data so that you can make actionable recommendations from it. Absolutely. I mean, uh, where you were saying all of that, uh, my watch, which is a Garmin uh, uh, Vivo Active, just told me that start sleep. And it doesn't know that I'm talking to you right now. I'm on a call. So I, I I'm totally with you there that we need uh, to, to learn to correlate all this data. But also these devices need to be aware of um, the other devices and other things that are going on in your life. I mean, if a sleep tracker is telling me uh, you didn't sleep um, more than five hours last night and go back to sleep and it doesn't know that my schedule is fully packed and there's a reason why i slept only five hours so it's like okay right. great thank you a lot for reminding me of that but it's impossible as we speak so that's the thing about some of these devices it's like it's uh, it's, it's not really very smart in terms of the context and understanding the patterns in your life or just being at least aware of uh, wh where you are uh, at this specific moment so let's hope that that uh, uh, develops in the future. Um, but I think we are running out of time pretty soon. So I, I'd like to ask you about um, uh, what would be the things uh, in your life that you would teach to your kids? Uh, so if you were wiser, uh, uh, so what, what, would, what would be the things that uh, you would hand forward uh, as, you know, some of the prime uh, beneficial things that you learned in your life uh, of uh, optimizing, automating, and outsourcing things. So what would be the key things? Uh, the, the first one would honestly be that you have to recognize that 70% of the things that you do can be done by other people and other things and should be. And we need to be in the mindset as we grow that you need to be offloading that stuff every year in order to improve. And that's a hard thing for a lot of people to let go of because everyone wants to feel like they're special and they are, but they want to feel like everything that they do is special and unique and they're the only ones that can do it. And that is a, that's an anchor. It's a really, really bad mindset. And the thing is, is it's a lot of people would see that as like anti motivated and anti success. And it's, it's quite the opposite. You know, if you, if you have to tell somebody like, like most of the things you're doing are obsolete, most of the things you're doing shouldn't be done by you. Most of the things that you're doing shouldn't be done by anybody, honestly, but they can be, and they can be done by machines or they can, and, and you need to be able to focus on the 30% of things that only you can do. And even if that means you're sitting around half the day, just thinking that might be the best thing that you can do for your health, success, happiness, and that of society. So you need to let go of this concept that you're the only one that can do these things. 
no matter what it is. Uh, and, that, and that's a big one. I think that's a, that goes hand in hand with humility and integrity and a lot of other sort of emotional aspects of our lives. So I think that's, that's a big one. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, in school, we are teach to go to tests alone and uh, be capable of surviving every situation on our own. And now we have to learn the completely opposite, which is really, uh, re really question the need to do things yourself and always look out for uh, other people and their help uh, in your social networks. And those being, in some cases, even automated assistants, uh, artificial intelligence or non-human appliances that would help you to get your stuff done. So uh, amazing, uh, Ari, Ari. And uh, this, this has been awesome to talk to you. It's infinite pleasure. Uh, and uh, I hope to see you at Biohacker Summit. Uh, you're going to be talking about less doing, more living. And uh, I'm looking forward to learn more from you uh at the conference as well i can't wait to be in helsinki awesome thank you